All right, recording started. Uh, good day to all uh, all participants to our uh, fortnightly uh, SPS online seminar series, uh, which is uh, now uh, going on for like two months. And we have uh, we are very pleased to welcome tonight Professor. Well, tonight would be my time, but anyway, Professor Yong Jan Song from Clemson University, uh, which is in South Carolina. For those who don't know, and uh, he he will be presenting a work on multi-stage stochastic programming applied to a humanitarian uh, hurricane uh, type of uh, uh, logistic problem. And I just uh, uh, remind very few uh, um, elements of his uh, still uh, uh, young career. Uh, he graduated in, he had his PhD uh, under James Luke uh, supervision in the University of uh, Wisconsin in, in 2013. So uh, kind of 10 years ago. And he's, uh, he's actually already associate professor. He is a recipient of a US National Science Foundation uh, Career Award in 2021. And uh, his interest uh, spans from optimization and uncertainty, particularly on uh, applied to healthcare problems and logistic problems. And, and uh, as we will see tonight on, on, uh, on logistics problem related to, to extreme events and extreme uh, extreme weather conditions, okay? So uh, thanks a lot, Jongja, for accepting our invitation and we look forward to your presentation. So you have 45 minutes. We leave some time to discussion and afterwards, you know, remarks by, by the participants. So thank you very much. Right, great, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so thank you very much for the very nice introduction and thank you for uh, having me in the SPS virtual seminar series. It's my pleasure to talk about some recent research on the uh, multi-stage stochastic programming for disaster relief logistics planning. And uh, this is collaboration with my uh, current PhD student, Sudan Butterai at Clemson University, uh, and also Murray Fedor from the uh, University of Edinburgh. Uh, Margarita Castro from PUC Chile, and uh, my former PhD student, uh, Merwan Stig, who is currently at uh, RWTH Aachen University. So uh, this is an application-driven uh, research, and our motivating application is the natural disasters. And uh, this is year 2020, and uh, in this figure, we have the, uh, the US $2020 billion weather and climate disasters which are the uh, weather and climate disaster events uh, that has cost more than 1 billion US dollars. Uh, and we also know that on top of that, we have the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020s. So this is really a year of a disaster. Um, so uh, in the places where I live, uh, South Carolina, which is on the um, uh, south southeastern part of the US, uh, the number one threat in terms of the natural disaster is the uh, hurricane event, and that's the um, that's the sort of a disaster event that I'm going to focus on uh, in today's talk. Uh, so fast forward to 2022, this is Hurricane Ian, one of the uh, most devastating uh, hurricane events to the state of Florida. Uh, it has caused more than 160 fatalities. Uh, in this case, one more than 100 billion dollar damage and also caused widespread uh, power outage and flooding in Florida. Uh, so disaster relief efforts must be continuously improved for the well-being of the citizens of the vulnerable communities. So this problem is actually a great opportunity for optimizers because uh, logistic planning for hurricane disaster relief is a large-scale uh, network optimization, a logistic optimization problem. There are a lot of uh, complex decision making involved in this process. Um, so this is sort of the national um, disaster response framework that's outlined by the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency, FEMA, in the United States. So typically we have some distribution centers that are located all over the country. Then for a specific event, 
uh, incident support base ISB will be established. And then there will be staging areas that are used for consolidating different commodities from different areas. And finally, we have the point of distributions where the victims will collect their um, commodities. And then a lot of uh, decisions are involved, such as uh, when, where, and how much quantity of the relief items uh, to pre-position ahead of an impending hurricane event. And also after the hurricane, how do we um, distribute the relief commodities to the affected population? So this is not only an uh, opportunity for optimizers, but also a great opportunity for stochastic programmers. And hopefully uh, by the end of the talk, we all know uh, more about that. And the reason is that these hurricane events are slow onset natural disaster events, unlike earthquakes, which comes with almost no uh, notice. Um, typically, the forecast information is available up to five days, right? So we do have time to monitor and respond according to the uh, forecast information. And here's a map uh, or an Im image that is uh, sort of typical in the forecast as one of the forecast products, uh, which is given by the National Hurricane Center. Uh, and this kind of forecast advisory or forecast product is going to be updated periodically, typically every six hours. And then we also have the wide available historical forecast error data so that we can analyze the uncertainty that is involved in the forecast. Um, so uh, from my perspective, I can categorize uh, different kinds of levels of uncertainty. Uh, the level one uncertainty is something that we have seen already. That is the forecast uh, uncertainty. And uh, this uncertainty can be with respect to any attributes of the hurricane, such as the intensity, trajectory, uh, the area, and also the forward speed. Uh, and as I said, we have a historical data on the hurricane forecast error um, database. So that is the level one uncertainty. The level two uncertainty is that even if we have a precise, accurate um, forecast about the hurricane event, the demand that is gonna cause by the impact of the hurricane is not only depend on the hurricane's own attributes, but also depend on the community's response to it. So the community resilience and human behavior of course plays a very important role here. And all, not only that, uh, the level three uncertainty is that these hurricane events are, uh, these hurricane forecasts are updated uh, over time. So it, instead of having a static forecast, we have a rolling forecast every six hours by the National Hurricane Center. So uh, in this talk, I'm gonna focus on primarily on the level one uncertainty, but there are a lot of other opportunities that we can uh, uh, solve these kind of problems. Okay, so in the literature of stochastic programming, uh, most of the literature has been focused on static two-stage stochastic program. And this is a result of a natural separation of the pre-event operation and the post-event operation. The pre-event operation is the stage one decisions, which is concerned about the inventory of the relief items that's pre-positioned, Sometimes we need to consider the facility location and expansion, et cetera. And then the post-event decision is concerned about the distribution of the relief items, the point of the distributions, after observing the realization of the randomness, which includes the supply, demand, uh, our capacity, et cetera. So the good news about this approach is that we only need a static probability distribution on the hurricane forecast or demand scenarios, which is suitable for long-term strategic or tactical planning. But the bad news is that it does not incorporate the evolving uncertainty at the operational level, which I think is a missed opportunity to create logistics plans that are adaptive to the updating the information um, in, this, uh, in this situation. So if we are going to apply a two-stage stochastic programming, to a framework to this problem, then we run into what I call the two-stage stochastic programmers, programmers dilemma. So the dilemma is in terms of the timing of a static logistics plan, because if we start too early, then uh, because of lack of information, this is likely to lead to decisions that are either too conservative or too risky. But on the other hand, if we start too late, then it might be costly or even infeasible to satisfy the demand. So the main research question here is how we can construct the logistics planning policies that are adaptive 
to the dynamic evolution of the hurricane over time. And for that, I think this is a great opportunity for multi-stage stochastic programmers because multi-stage stochastic programming models are designed for sequential decision-making problems under uncertainty. So here, just a general notation. So we assume that we have some knowledge about some underlying stochastic process, which is denoted by the CTs. And then the dynamic of the event uh, is uh, illustrated as, as follows. So at the start, we have some initial states, x0, and we have a realization of the random event, which is assumed to be deterministic in multi-stage stochastic program in stage t equal to 1. And after that, we're going to make a decision. Then the post-decision state x1 is going to be carried over to stage 2, in which case we're going to observe a realization of the random event c2, and then we make a decision. Then the post decision state is going to be carried over to the following state, stage, and this is going to uh, carry on until the last stage of the planning horizon. So here we can distinguish two different types of decision variables: the uh, state variables x t, which is highlighted here, and then the local variables y t. And it is the state variables that links all the states together in this case. So in the context of our, of our disaster relief logistics network optimization problem, so we have a, a, a set of distribution centers and a set of staging areas and point of distributions. So these are the locations in our uh, lo uh, logistics network model. And the goal is to minimize the total logistics cost, including transportation, procurement, inventory, um, plus the penalty for the demand shortage. So the state variables here is going to be the inventory levels at the staging areas. And then the local variables corresponds to the relief commodity flow, demand satisfaction, etc. OK, so now we are ready to actually uh, write down a nested formulation for the multi-stage stochastic program, keeping in mind that we are trying to minimize the total expected cost. So the total expected cost can be written as minimizing the first cost plus the expected future costs with respect to the first stage. So that's why you see that this conditional expectation uh, in this formulation is taken with respect to uh, the event that has been realized so far. And then we move on to the second stage. We're going to minimize the cost in the second stage plus the expected cost to go. With respect to the second stage, we include everything uh, remaining. So that's why we have this nested uh, structure here. And then the feasible region that is defined at each stage is going to be depend on the state variable that's carried over from the previous stage, as well as the realization of the random variable CT at that stage. So that's the, uh, the, the formulation. And typically, we have a set of sample paths that is available maybe from historical data that is used as input to the multi-stage stochastic program. So that's typically a starting point of the modeling. But it's not necessarily true that in our context, this uh, scenario path or sample path exists. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how to generate them in this uh, particular context. So in the forecast, as we have seen in this picture, uh, we typically have this best track forecast, which is a consensus, consensus of a bunch of uh, forecast models. Uh, so we can see that that corresponds to the central line. So that's the best forecast. That's official forecast given by the National Hurricane Center. But we also admit that there are forecast errors in terms of all kinds of attributes, such as track and intensity. And that is why you see these forecast error cones that's surrounding this central line. So motivated by this uh, by this structure, so what we see, what we do is that we can look at the forecast error data from historical data, and then to capture the autocorrelation of the uh, forecast error in different attributes, we actually uh, can fit a time series model, for example, autoregressive model of order one, to capture the uh, the autocorrelation of the forecast error, and then by sampling from this time series model, we can create sample path information on the focus error. And then we're going to overlay this focus error on top of this best track forecast in order to create this set of sample path. And that is the starting point uh, or the data input to our model. 
Okay, so then we can follow the uh, sort of the standard in multi-stage stochastic program modeling to create a scenario tree, which discretize this uh, stochastic process here. And just, scenario tree is a generic model for doing that. And now we need to define uh, a copy of the decision variables, including the state variables xn and the local variables yn for each node of n of the scenario tree. So scenario tree model is very generic. It's a very powerful tool. However, uh, it, the challenge here is that we may have experienced many of these scenario tree nodes as the number of uh, stages increase. So what we choose to do here is that, is that we, we actually um, uh, discretize the stochastic process using a Markov chain discretization. And there are several different benefits of doing the, the uh, Markov chain discretization. The first benefit is that if the underlying stochastic process is approximated by a Markov chain process, then the expectation, conditional expectation that we take at each stage can be taken only with respect to the Markovian state at each stage. So, uh, also, so, that, so, uh, so the Markovian state corresponds to the, uh, the hurricane's attributes, which includes the intensity and the location information. Uh, in our context. So another benefit of this, this discretizing the stochastic process as a Markovian uh, Markov chain uh, process is that we can address the unique challenge of having a random number of stages in the hurricane logistics planning due to the random termination time, because we can ca categorize different Markovian states as transient states versus absorbing states. And uh, for the absorbing states, that's the states that corresponds to the termination of this process, which can correspond to when the hurricane makes landfall or deviates from the study region, or when the last time period in the planning horizon is reached, and that's the termination of the, of the process. So that allows us to model the, uh, the early termination of the process due to maybe the speed of the hurricane or maybe due to the geographical uh, structure of the study region. So the biggest benefit of doing the Markov chain discretization is that it allows us to write down this dynamic programming recursive uh, formulation in such a concise way. So basically this uh, encodes the problem or the decision making that we're gonna make in every uh, stage T. So given the state variable carried over from previous stage X T minus one and the realization of the random variable CT, we're going to focus on minimizing the current stage cost plus the expected cost to go, which now depends on the uh, on the Markovian states that we are in, in this stage. So of course, for the absorbing states, there will be no uh, future cost. So the expected cost to go function will be a constant equal to zero. But for transient states, uh, this will be defined in a standard way. And then the decision policy at each state uh, in stage T is going to be induced by the uh, expected cost to go function. And then in our case, we know that uh, this is known to be a polyhedral convex function uh, for the logistic planning problem with all continuous uh, variables and linear constraints so that we can use the cutting plane approximation to approximate the expected cost to go function. So this is the sort of the uh, celebrated SDDP algorithm uh, which does this sequential uh, uh, update or refinement of the cutting plane approximation to the polyhedral convex expected cost to go function. It consists of two pass, two passes, the forward pass, which is to move forward in time by randomly sampling the current, uh, sampling the Markovian state in each stage. And then we use the current approximation to obtain a state in each stage on the sample path. And then we go backward in time through this backward pass and we're gonna solve all of the subproblems that's associated with all of the Markov chain states in each stage, using these states collected in the forward pass as a reference point to generate linear uh, lower approximating cuts. And you can notice that in order to propagate the exact cut information, we may have to take several iterations, sometimes a large number of iterations uh, to get the correct information from the, uh, 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 the cut information. Uh, but the Markov chain uh, uh, property also allows us to do a lot of cut sharing um, to in order to speed up the performance of this algorithm. 
Okay, so that's all. That's a general overview of the uh, multi-stage scientific programming and the solution approach to tackle this problem. However, if someone insists on applying two-stage stochastic programming on this problem, uh, here's what they would do. So in the first stage, they are actually going to decide the state variables, xt, not only for stage one, but also throughout the entire planning horizon. So all of the state variables xt will be decided all at time equal to one. And then at each of the stage uh, that is greater than one, we just observe the random realization of the event and then make the corresponding local decisions. So what is essentially happening is that all of the state variables are going to be uh, decided at stage, at stage one. And then in each node of the scenario tree, basically um, you know, the problem is going to be decomposable for each node of the scenario tree to just to handle these local um, control variables. So one possible extension of that is to make these uh, state variables to be adaptive to the realized data according to a fixed structure, which is uh, the idea of the linear decision rule, which we are going to talk about later on as well. So if someone is not satisfied with the static nature of a two-stage stochastic programming model, then they can do something like a rolling horizon, in which case, at every stage, they are going to solve a static two-stage stochastic program as a look-ahead model over the remainder of the planning horizon, but they only implement the decision at the current time. So this is, of course, an online decision policy, which is naturally adaptive to the system state. So this is how, how it works. And the good news is that you know, this is very effective to obtain a sort of a partially adaptive decisions. And it is also applicable even when the scenario tree may be updated over time. Uh, for example, those scenario trees are constructed according to the rolling hurricane forecast. That's the level three uncertainty that is uh, said in the start of the presentation. However, the bad news is that it is hard to establish any optimality guarantee because of the dynamic programming optimality criterion is not enforced here. Alternative approach is to directly attack this dilemma in the timing of the static logistics plan for the two-stage SCSI programming. And the idea is that we're going to wait until the best time to commit to a static logistics plan, which strikes a balance between the value of information that you gain through waiting and the cost of postponing the execution of a logistics plan. So this is sort of an optimal uh, stopping time problem. So basically at each time t, if you are at an absorbing state, then the problem degenerates into a deterministic problem with realized demand. So we know what to do optimally there. But at a transient state, uh, if there's no commitment that has been made yet, then we have two possible choices to make. If we choose to, uh, to do no go, then essentially we do nothing. And we, then we're going to wait until the next state to re revisit our uh, decision making here. But if we choose to go, then we commit to a static logistics plan that is constructed by solving a two-stage stochastic programming problem based on the information that you have at that moment. So this allows us to write down this dynamic programming uh, recursion, which essentially says if CT belongs to an absorbing state, the, the best uh, uh, thing to do is just to optimize uh, the deterministic problem at that point. However, if it is a transient state, then you have this choice of committing to a static plan using the information right now, or you defer to the next stage uh, to make the decision, but you don't know where you're going to be in the next stage, so this is going to be expected um, a value that's calculated here. So this can be this dynamic programming can, can be solved by going backward in time, uh, in which you're going to solve a static two-stage stochastic programming problem for every transient Markov chain state uh, in this um, problem. And the good news is that this is very intuitive decision policy, but the bad news is that um, we only have limited adaptability here because once you decide to go, you lose the adaptability uh, in the remainder of the planning horizon. Okay, so we have talked about the multi-stage SCSI programming approach and then three variants of two-stage SCSI programming approach, static rolling horizon and decision tree based. So now we're going to uh, see some computational results, in which case we're gonna compare the performance gap with a 
clairvoyant solution, which assumes perfect information. And in this setting, we're going to uh, have this uh, uh, assumption that the uh, unit logistics cost is increasing over time with respect to a cost increment factor. And we can define this cost increment factor as the cost of adaptability. If you decide to be adaptive rather than uh, early commitment, then you're going to pay higher cost later on in the planning horizon. Okay, so this is the uh, computational results. And as I said, uh, the gap here is compared with the full information solution. So the higher the bar, the worse the, the, the performance is. So we can see that if the cost of uh, adaptability is not very large, in this case 0 0.05, the multi-stage stochastic programming solution can achieve a near optimal solution uh, with respect to the full information variant. But if the uh, cost of adaptability is higher, in this case equal to five, then it yields a very large gap. If you look at the uh, uh, static two-stage stochastic program, it's exactly the opposite story. It seems to have a much higher gap when new is small, but has a smaller gap when new is larger. And in fact, if the cost of the adaptability is very large, all four decision policies corresponds to similar performance in the end, although we see that the multi-stage strategy program still has a significant edge against other approaches. The rolling horizon two-stage strategy program is very similar to the behavior of a static strategy program, but has a little bit of an advantage uh, over that. The decision tree policy is interesting. It can do very well when new is very small. It, it, it does almost the same as multi-stage stochastic program, but when new is very large, it behaves exactly the same as the static two-stage stochastic program. And the underlying explanation is that if the cost of adaptivity is very high, essentially we are pushed to do to make an early commitment, which essentially does no difference to the decision tree policy against the static policy. So to understand that even, even better, so here we uh, look at a small range of this new and we plot uh, in this picture, the average amount of relief commodity procurement by the multi-stage stochastic programming solution to see uh, where are the logistics costs coming from. So we can see that if new is very small, in this case, you can see that the procurement actually does not happen at the start of the planning horizon they would like to wait until the right time to procure the relief items and do the logistics operation. However, if new start to become very large, then uh, the cost of adaptivity becomes very large, then all of the operations are pushed to the early stages in the planning horizon. And this is the, the early commitment uh, behavior of the solutions. And that is the reason why we see that all of the four policies behave very similarly as this new increases. Okay, so that's all I want to talk about uh, for the value of multi-stage uh, stochastic program at this point. And now I would like to uh, switch gear a little bit and discuss the discrete decision-making in hurricane relief logistics planning. And specifically, we're gonna talk about uh, disaster relief logistics planning with adaptive contingency modality activation. Uh, so this is motivated by a practical consideration. Uh, so this figure is actually taken from a government uh, document uh, by South Carolina uh, uh, Hurricane Plan. And among all of the operations that we see here, uh, we have this South Carolina National Guard phased activation. Um, so this is the contingency modality activation, uh, which has this kind of uh, all or nothing feature. Uh, so once this operation is activated, uh, it's going to follow a series of activities to expand the network's capabilities to better serve the demand. Uh, so in this case, since it's an all or nothing feature, we need to use a binary variable or discrete variable to model the uh, contingency modality choice and also the timing of its uh, activation. So in order to do that, we introduce this binary variable Z uh, which denotes whether or not a contingency modality L is going to be activated. And we're going to insert that into the logistics optimization uh, problem, resulting in the multi-stage stochastic program with mixed integer state variable 
and continuous local variables. So a bad news here is that this has, will cause the expected cost to go function to become a non-convex function. Uh, so in the literature, we know that for multi-stage linear program, where we know that the expected cost to go function has this nice polyhedral convex uh, structure, then we can do SDDP algorithm or markup chain SDDP algorithm. If we have integer variables, then much less can be done. But for the special case of uh, pure binary state variables, uh, the celebrated SDD IP algorithm uh, can generate Lagrangian cuts, which are linear cuts by solving the Lagrangian dual, uh, which can provide a valid and tight uh, cuts at the binary points. And this is able to handle uh, the non-convexity uh, expected cost goal function as well. But for uh, mixed integer state variables, uh, much less can be said. And there are uh, some very recent literature on this uh, domain, this is very active uh, research direction. And I see that there are many uh, experts here in this audience that are working on this problem. Um, but again, much less can be said about uh, this uh, computationally, uh, especially the computational uh, uh, successful stories. Um, there, are, there are very few of them. Um, so uh, because of time, I'm not going to go through uh, this literature review. But basically, our idea is that we're going to construct a partially extended formulation by relocating all of the integer state variables C to the first stage so that we can circumvent this non-convex expected cost to go function uh, from the beginning. So in order to do that, basically, we need to construct a scenario tree based on the Markov chain uh, stochastic process in order to and in order to capture the adaptability of the C variables, we need to introduce one copy of such C variables for every single node in this scenario tree, and then relocate all of them back to the first stage. So in our root node, or the first stage problem, we have a large number, potentially large number, of integer state variables C. And we're going to talk about how to deal with that in a minute. But the benefit of doing that is that at the tree node, uh, we just need to take these C variables, uh, the value of these C variables as an input. And then the value function associated with each of the tree nodes is going to be polyhedral convex again, so that we can uh, use the SDP algorithm um, for that. So of course, the big issue here is that we may end up with exponentially many uh, integer state variables um, in the first stage. Uh, so we create this aggregation framework to make these integer state variables to be uh, only partially adaptive uh, based on the underlying Markov chain structure. And we call them the Markov chain based contingency modality policies. So here's the illustration. So if we choose to be fully adaptive, we allow these uh, Z variables to be fully adaptive. Then essentially for every single node in the scenario tree, we have a copy of these Z variables in this case, 15 of them. If we choose this C to be adaptive only with respect to time, so for different times, we have different uh, Z variable, Z uh, decisions. Then we arrive at this here and now policy. In this case, we only need to have four copies of these Z variables. And we can also make it adaptive with respect to the current Markov chain states so for each different Markov chain state. We have a distinct copy of these Z variables. In this case, we have seven of them. Or we can go one step further. We can choose to be adaptive to the combination of the previous and the current Markov chain states. In this case, we're going to have 11 of them. So clearly, we have this hierarchy structure of you know, uh, aggregation, level of aggregation. And of course, the quality of the decision policy is going to be um, uh, depend on this uh, level of aggregation. And later on, we're going to make a computational investigation on this trade-off. But at the end of the day, we still have this uh, uh, mixed integer stochastic programming uh, problem, a multi-stage stochastic programming problem to solve. But in this case, all of the integer variables are in the first stage or at the root node of the scenario tree. And that has that uh, so this allows us to uh, separate uh, this process into a first stage problem and the remaining scenario tree problem. In the first stage problem, because of the existence of integer variables, we're going to do a branch and bound process. 
And then the remaining scenario three will just be a multi-stage stochastic linear programming problem in which we can use SDP algorithm to generate cuts. So essentially we create a branching cut tree and uh, every time we arrive at an incumbent solution in the branch and bound process, essentially we're going to solve uh, MCSDDP to evaluate each incumbent integer solution from the branch and bounds. However, this expected cost to go function approximation are warm started. So that seems to be the only benefit. However, it is still very computationally challenging. So we benchmark this on a variety of test instances uh, with different types of uh, uh, modality choices and also uh, different uh, initial capacities, uh, which is chosen to be different uh, percentage of maximum demand in our specific application. So we look at the performance on different aggregation schemes on the here and now and uh, the more adaptive uh, policy MM and we compare our uh, uh, performance against the extended formulation. And just to give an idea, in this small instance on the HN uh, policy, we have 80 of these uh, first stage integer variables. And for MM, we have more than 6,000 of them. So for this set of results, we can see that in terms of computational time, uh, it takes more time than the extended formulation. And also in some of the instances that we are not able to solve within the time limit, we end up with a large optimality gap. Uh, so this is rather uh, disappointing results, I would say. And for larger instances, although the extended formulation cannot solve the problem because of out of memory uh, in this uh, branching cut plus SDP, end up with a very large automatic gap. And again, for these larger instances, we have a lot more integer variables in the first stage. And that partially explains why the computational performance is not satisfactory. So uh, this is very disappointing results. So that prompts us to look for alternative approach. And the idea is that uh, we admit the computational challenge of treating this branch and cut as the integrated algorithm as a standalone exact solution approach. And instead of doing that, we actually take a lighter version of it to generate a lower bound. And we can do that by uh, limiting the number of forward and backward paths and to have a milder uh, con uh, convergence criterion but the aim is to generate a lower bound here. But a lower bound is not enough. We also need a strong upper bound or a feasible decision policy to accompany with this lower bound. So for that, we apply the two-stage linear decision rules. And the idea is that we're gonna further restrict the continuous state variables, which in our case corresponds to the inventory variables in each node of the, brand, uh, of the scenario tree, to be a fine function of the sample path data. And in this case, we can collapse this multi-stage stochastic program into a two-stage stochastic program as what we saw before. And among all of the LDR variants, the one that depends on the markup chain information turns out to give the best of performance. And to solve this corresponding LDR uh, um, for a model, uh, it is a, a standard uh, uh, two-stage stochastic integer program, uh, where the first state decision includes all of these uh, integer z variables and also the linear coefficients mu here. And then we can solve this problem using the standard Bender's decomposition approach. Okay, so for the remaining time of this talk, I'm going to focus on the solution quality and, uh, uh, and, the, and the policy behaviors. So first of all, uh, we can... Uh, before we do that, first of all, we can re-examine the computational performance of this bounding approach. And we see that we can do much better in terms of getting a strong uh, bound, getting a good solution uh, with respect to the extended formulation. So we can see that uh, even if we include both the time for generating lower uh, and uh, upper bound, we can uh, achieve a better performance than the extended formulation in both the small, uh, the, uh, uh, the HM policy and MM policy. But we also see that uh, for HM policy, we can almost uh, reach the optimal solution uh, for the LDR. And for the MM policy, we get very close to optimal solutions. For large instances, of course, the extended formulation is gonna run out of memory, uh, but we can still see that, you know, the gap between the upper and lower bound, and in this case, is actually a pessimistic estimation of the automatic gap. 
you can see that the LDR solution can provide very strong, uh, very high quality uh, decision policy with very small optimality gap. And for MM policy, it starts to struggle a little bit and the optimality gap gets uh, uh, as high as 7%, but this is still satisfactory given the complexity of the underlying problem. And we also see that the uh, even the lower bounding, uh, lighter version of the integrated SDDP plus branching cut end up uh, with the large uh, computational time. So that is still lagging behind. Okay, so the takeaway message is here that you know, as, as a standalone approach, the branching cut plus SD, SDDP uh, is unable to close the gap. Uh, its computational performance needs to be uh, enhanced. But we find that the lower bounding uh, technique using that approach is very effective. And the two-stage LDR approach can generate very high quality decision policies within a reasonable amount of time. OK, so now we can talk about the quality of the underlying uh, solution uh, policies. Uh, so first of all, again, this is the same set of uh, instances with different initial uh, capacities. And we investigate the, the gap between the least adaptive policy agent and the most uh, adaptive uh, policy uh, full history. And then we look at uh, a variety of our markup chain uh, contingency policy. So we see that first of all, if the initial capacity is very high, which is uh, correspond to 30% in this case, we see that even the, uh, the least adaptive policy HN can lead to a very high quality policy. So the value of adaptability is limited if we have plenty of resource. However, if the resource is scarce, the initial capacity is relatively low, then we do see a large value of adaptability. And among these cases, we see that the markup chain policy cannot uh, close the gap between this uh, HN and FH by too much. And we're gonna explain why that's the case later. But we do see that if we include more information into the uh, markup chain uh, aggregation policy, we do can close uh, more than 50% of the gap, in some cases, almost 100% of the gap. So now we can investigate the solution behavior that is provided by different policies on this particular problem. What we look at is the percentage of the nodes where a contingency modality is activated, different levels of contingencies that are activated by different policies, and also the amount of expansion by different policies uh, in this, in this uh, table. The first thing that we see is that among all of the policies, if we have a low initial capacity that leads to sort of more contingency mortality activation, and we end up with the more aggressive mortality choices, which lead to higher percentage of expansion. But when the capacity is higher, then much less um, modalities are activated with less aggressive modality choices. And again, this is related to uh, how much uh, resource do we have at the start of the planning horizon? If we compare the here and now policy, which is the least uh, adaptive policy with other aggregation, we can see that when the initial capacity is very low, it actually choose to uh, activate uh, all of the nodes uh, in this scenario tree. And when the capacity is higher, then uh, you choose to do not choose to uh, activate any of the nodes in the scenario tree. So we do have this kind of all or nothing feature that's established by the static policy here and now. And we can see that the MA policy is quite similar to that. On the contrary, the MM policy and the full history version will have this kind of wait and activate type of behavior. And it leads to more diverse choice of the contingency modalities. And also we can see a better balance between the percentage of nodes and the, uh, and the aggressiveness of the expansion, which means that they are able to identify the right time and the right conditions modality at the right place. And that is the benefit of the adaptability here. And finally, let's look at the reason why the markup chain uh, based policy does not do as well as, as, a, uh, as well as what we expect it to be. So here we plot the uh, different nodes in color. So the red nodes corresponds to the nodes that are initially activated. The green nodes corresponds to the activation of the nodes due to their parents' act activation. And the orange nodes corresponds to the nodes that are activated passively. So for example, if we focus on MA here, 
suppose we initially activate this red node, then these two green nodes are activated based on that the activation of that red node. But these two uh, orange nodes, maybe uh, they may not benefit from the modality activation, but they are going to be activated because they share exactly the same Markov chain state with these two green nodes. So they are sort of passively activated. So we see that this is an unintended consequence of the Markov chain aggregation because they are going to passively act activating a bunch of nodes which may not benefit from this modality activation. So in some sort, this effect of the modality activation is averaged out due to this significant propagation that's happening in this particular policy, which explains why uh, it does not give a much better performance than the a static policy here and now. And for MN, much less uh, propagation can be, can be uh, observed. And for the full history version, there's no propagation uh, at all. So that explains sort of the full adaptability and why that works so well. Okay, so uh, as a conclusion, uh, hopefully we have seen sort of the value of the multi-stage stochastic programming problem. Uh, especially in this context of disaster relief logistics planning. And the results actually call for more computational and algorithmic enhancements to solve this very, very challenging, but practically meaningful problems. And we see the benefit of both the exact approach and also approximation approaches. So in terms of future directions, uh, the data-driven version of this multi-stage stochastic mix are very interesting to investigate. And also the multi-stage stochastic mixed into the programming problems with decision-dependent uncertainty and also its relevance in this particular context as well. So with that, I'd like to close my uh, talk and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Georgia, for a really interesting topic and uh, presentation. So now, uh...